Okay. Hello, lovely people. This is part two of Kate Grenville's The, the Lieutenant. I'm reading The Astronomer as I say that. So part two of The Astronomer is where we're kicking off. And of course, we start as ever with Begin As You Mean To Go On, which is italics and also language. I would, you know, if it were perhaps a more typical character, we would annotate that for sort of friendship or love or connection, but that's not really something that's super important to him. Uh, it could not be hurried. Uh, so this, to me, is really important characterization, sort of uh, his approach to the world uh, and sort of his lack of flexibility around things. So he's talking about kind of taking taking the geometry. So basically we're, we're on the boat and there's uh, multiple people that are sort of in charge of the navigation and he is kind of, I guess, like a bonus add-on just because he's an astronomer and happens to be uh, expert in these sort of things and uh, he kind of describes the way that he works with his colleagues and this is yeah, very important for our characterization because uh, we get to see how he interacts with sort of peers, colleagues, equals. So Gardner, a burly sunburnt sailor, was big in every sense. Everything about him was on a generous scale. So we've got simile, which is one of our rare rook similes. So when you find one you can kind of uh, have to point it out as much as you can because keep in mind Kate Granville is a very floral uh, and good, I guess, writer and uh, Rook is sort of her creative challenge, I guess, to be uh, a little bit less sort of verbose and so that's partly why I believe Silk is a character that's being used often uh, for that purpose. So show yourself my beauty, none of this mod modesty. She is a teaser and today it is Mr Rook she favour favours. So this is Barton, his colleague, not a super important character, but you know, kind of gives you a bit of an idea of the way, sort of the unscientific way that kind of his contemporaries might view things. So he thinks of, you know, the, the sun, kind of a sort of like a, a woman that can be, you know, a cruel mistress perhaps, whereas for Rook it is always scientific and there's nothing uh, humorous or humane or human about it. So, uh, 47, I am referring to Captain Cook's report on having nosegays thrown at him by young ladies here. So a nosegay is basically, <laughs> from memory, are like a handkerchief that you put something nice smelling on so that you can uh, cover up, uh, I believe back then they believed it sort of defended against disease and things. So you know, during plague years people would walk around with things over their noses and just more practically people stank because they didn't wash themselves back then. So hence. Those gays were sort of your way of protecting yourself from the stinky world that was around. Uh, Alright, so this is uh, Rook's writing. We were so deplorably unfortunate as to walk every evening before that balconies without being honoured with a single bouquet, though, though nymphs and flowers were in equal and great abundance. So obviously that's very floral writing and that's kind of the point. Now, to, now tell me frankly, Rook, as a friend, what do you think? Very clever, very deft of phrasing, Rook said, but have you ever really walked there every morning? So of course for Rook, he's, um, he sort of recognises a little bit that the purpose of language is sort of to show off and kind of to be clever. Um, but then straight away he, you know, he, he brings it straight back to language always because have you ever really done that? Otherwise you shouldn't be writing about it, sort of his view. Rook snaps back, ah, oh, Rook, the man of science, let's call it poetic license, my friend. So you've sort of got a obvious comparison between kind of Rook and I mean, Silk. So this could be really useful as, I, I guess it's from and I highlighted as friendship, but it would be really useful to kind of use as kind of an exploration of the foil nature of the two characters and how they work together or against one another and so forth. It was foreign to Rook the idea of taking the real world as nothing more than raw material. His gift lay in measuring, calculating, de deducing. Silk was to cut and embellish until a pebble was transformed into a gem. So again, that's his knowledge of the world, his view of the world, his worldview. So I guess he's kind of basically just again underlining the difference between the two of them which uh, becomes when they obviously when they kind of hits land, things become a little bit more um, juicy and the reason that they're establishing this characterization early is so that once they sort of get thrown into the you know, the deep end, as it were, uh, you kind of have a really good idea of how they might react and that makes it a bit more interesting, I guess. 
Page 48. It is always with him to a greater or lesser degree, the surgeon had told them in the mess, the kidneys in my view, or perhaps the gallbladder. So basically the Commodore, I'm not exactly sure exactly on military rank and what all that means. I think it might be a naval term, but uh, he's got something wrong with him. And so his, uh, his surgeon looks after him. And again, this is uh, interesting use of italics. So again, we kind of, we know that Rook is sort of, I don't know, imbibed these little phrases and kept them with him. Um, but there was compassion under his bonhomie. So bonhomie is kind of like uh, bohemian. Uh, that's sort of the original stem of bohemian. It just means kind of being loose, being happy, being joyous, being free, which is, I guess, something that you know the surgeon is, uh, but the Commodore definitely is not. So I'm just going to sort of chunk this bit. It's really, it's probably not especially quotable, but it is really, um, it talks about the way that he sees the timekeeper role as so majestic. It's very rule bound, it's very structured. Um, and as you know, we see the timekeeper has been wound. So once they use this sort of timekeeping clock, um, the three or four people that use it have to then say, the timekeeper has been wound, and that's sort of their way of um, double checking that things have been done. That's often the way that you do things uh, if something's super important, like if you're able to I don't know, launch a nuclear missile or a you know, spaceship or something like that, um, you would have a process like that where three, three or four people have to turn a key at the same time, or they need to say something like that, the timekeeper has been wound. And again, the repetition, the timekeeper has been wound, and he's sort of solemnly mouthing it, so he's kind of really into it. Um, there was another thing about the ritual of the winding. So this section is important because it takes us back to the colonial machine that he's a part of, and also the hierarchy. So it's not just that the colonial machine is a thing. There's also an element to it where he's, um, he's worried that he's very low on the rank, and so that's kind of going to bother him and challenge him but in this situation the kind of the hierarchy isn't important because in this moment he is the most important person on the ship among others of course so they see the natives as they're referred to here uh, and they yell out wara wara and he did not think they were calling welcome welcome he suspected a polite translation might be something like a go to the devil so straight away he's he's understanding that the well, perhaps he's misunderstanding, but he's assuming that they innately know that, okay, we're being invaded or, you know, we're being taken over or something like that. When, um, from what we know a little bit about uh, sort of oral histories that have been passed down, it took our Indigenous people a little while to sort of work out um, what, was, what was occurring, I guess, and that these people weren't just visiting like other people had in the past, but actually staying around Hugwood. So, page 53, we've got a simile, Barton look, at them like a cat. Barton, look at them like a cat that wants the cream but fears the milkmaid. So, that's a neat little simile again. Basically, uh, we're kind of having our first interaction on the beach, and they're kind of the indigenous men, uh, kind of a little bit unsure, a little bit curious, and a bit of a mixture of both. 52, the men were dark and naked, their faces shadowed in the sunlight, natives, Rook thought. I am face to face with natives, so you know he's um, the kind of the I guess the contrast between calling them men and then calling them natives. One is more humanising and one is less. So language is important there. Fifty four. The man dropped the looking glass on the sand as casually as a boy in Portsmouth might let go the core of an apple. So it's clear now that the uh, the people that they're face to face with aren't especially interested in their trinkets. And then just to borrow, he tried to explain by signs. So Waymark is trying to kind of act out, and this is useful for a whole bunch of things. We've got language here, we've got absence, we've got distance. So you can really feel viscerally the distance between these two groups and how they're really struggling to communicate and connect. 55, only the surgeon Rook thought could be so casual with the Commodore, but when a man had pul pulpated your side day after day, you would perhaps allow him a certain liberty. So pulpated basically just means kind of like if you imagine someone giving a resuscitation, sort of pressing on. So to pulpate is to vibrate, to press. So because of his disease or his illness, the surgeon has been kind of pressing on his side quite often. And then 56 to finish up, their faces were stony, which is of course foreshadowing of 
uh, the difficult interactions that will occur. So, and that's where we're up to. Up to this is all within part two, and the next is chapter two of part two.